Dear God, please open up your heart of mercy and help your nation, Hashem. There's no other nation that can replace this nation. That's why Hashem said He'll never break the bond with B'nai Israel. It's an eternal covenant. Leviticus 26, 44. I will punish them. I will berate them. I will be tough with them. But I will never, ever break my bond with them. It's an eternal covenant. I am their God. And they are my people. Go check how many times that's written. It's written in the book of Jeremiah. It's written in the book of the Torah. It's written in a bunch of places. I can guarantee you can find it in a hundred different places that God is calling himself the God of Israel and how he keeps saying how it's an eternal bond. Oti leolam, the word Shabbat, shin, bet, tough, shin for Shabbat, bet, brit, tough, tefillin. Those are the three eternal covenants that Hashem made with the Jews. That's a proof that it will never be broken. That bond's forever tefillin, forever. When the Mashiach comes, you will wear tefillin. What do you think, you won't? <laughs> you have no idea. You don't know what it means. Shabbat, when Mashiach comes, you will be keeping Shabbat. And Brit, you will have a Brit. Absolutely. To be a Jew, you need a Brit. Ma. Ah, Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. Look how low we fell at Kaddish Baruch Hu. Three covenants you made with us. The first one, with the golden calf. After we broke it, you have to make another covenant. What? With the sin of the spies. Why? Because everybody died. And then the children took over. So then with the new children that took over, that were his new nation, that were ready to enter Israel, he made a third covenant. And in that covenant, you know what he said? That's where he taught us, call Yisrael Aravim Zeh Lazeh. That every Jew, one Jew is responsible for another. Give you good proof. When you dive in Mincha Vidui, right away, you're saying things that you never did. Well, I was angry, forgive me for this, forgive me for adultery. You never committed adultery, so why are you saying that? Because each Jew is doing repentance for the other Jew. I'll give you something crazy. My mother doesn't keep Shabbat. It's very possible, I'm, I'm kind of stretching it, but you can understand what I mean. And you tell me if I'm wrong. My mother doesn't keep Shabbat. I keep Shabbat. Call Yisrael Aravim Zeh Lazeh. Hashem could take my Shabbat and give it to my mother. Why? Because we're all part of the same nation. We're all part of the same soul. We're all connected. That's why Hashem wants us to help each other. You know why? Because it breeds unity. And it's such a simple story, but it's so beautiful when you really listen to it. There was a father. He had 10 young, strong sons. And he wanted to teach them a beautiful lesson in unity. So he took 100 chopsticks and he bound them up in a bundle. And he said to the kids, here, try to break it. And each one tried to break it, and no one could break it. And they would try and try, and they could not break it. So they gave it to the dad. They said, can you break it? He said, absolutely. He untied the bundle, and he pulled out each chopstick one by one and cracked it. And he looked at them, and he said, listen, the lesson is to teach you when you, my sons, are together, nobody could break you. But if you're disjointed and not united... You will be broken one by one. It's a powerful lesson. Unity is what Hashem wants. You know how many people I've made peace with just for the sake of Hashem and for unity? I wanted to say something. I could have been rude. No, no. For what, man? Keep the peace. And some people will say, oh, you never know. You might need him. Nah, nah, nah. Nobody's thinking like that, bro. I'm not needing anybody. I have Hashem and Hashem can bring people to me if I need him. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about, I want to make peace. I want to show Hashem that I love His children. I want to show Hashem that when He commands me to make peace, I jump. I want Hashem to know that I'm His son. And I want Hashem to know that when He commands me to keep Shabbat, I do it. You know how proud I am of myself to keep Shabbat, bro? I wish you knew who I was, bro. Five, six years ago, I was on the beach on Shabbat, listening to music, kicking it to girls. What do you know? You don't know nothing, bro. And I had to work hard to keep Shabbat up. Completely, completely secular. Name me one Jew where I grew up. You cannot name me one Jew, bro. I'll start naming you the names. Renzo, JD, Tommy, Danu, Carlos, Pablo, Jamie. <laughs> Show me one Jew, bro. Get out of here, man. Come on. Wanda, Mike Mastuka, Jennifer. Come on, man. Yvette. Should I continue? Robin. Come on. Come on. Show me one Jew. 
grew up completely secular, kept Christmas. Because I used to go to the Murgatroyds to chill. And I used to get Christmas presents. Don't tell me no, bro. And I had to discover the Torah on my own. Not to know Yeshiva. My far parents sent me to Yeshiva. It was, was, come on, man. That Yeshiva did not bring me closer to God. I'm so sorry, Hashem, to say that, bro. And maybe it was me because I had desires and I was young. But no. Nah, the knowledge of Hashem is so strong If it's said the right way It'll smash any desire into a billion pieces Trust me, I know what I'm talking about Or rabbis would have left an impression on me With some knowledge Because like when you tell somebody, for example i give you an example If you tell somebody that the number 7 is holy Because it's 7 dimensions And every physical dimension has 6 sides So it's a 6 dimensions The 7 signifies out of physical nature Into something above nature Above the physical. That's why seven is a spiritual number. All the things are with seven. Shemitah. And then you have seven Shabbat. And then you have seven with Sukkot. And you have seven with Pesach. And you have seven, seven. Everything's seven. Why? I just told you. Because it symbolizes a spiritual holy number. That's Hashem's favorite number, so to speak. You understand? Now, if somebody tells you that at the age of ten, <clears throat> you'll never forget that knowledge. That's deep knowledge. You understand? Eternal knowledge that will save your soul and take you to heaven. Remember that. And if you think I'm joking, listen to my talks and you tell me if it's not going to bring you to heaven. You're tripping if you say it's not true. I'm going to read you some beautiful things from Parshat Nitzivim. But I'm going to show you Tshuva to Parshat Nitzivim tied into Rosh Hashanah. And I know people are going to hear this before Rosh Hashanah, before really Yom Kippur. During that search you made Tshuva, people are going to listen to this. Listen. I'm about to hit you with some deep, 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 deep knowledge, bro. So watch, number one. The first thing you have to know is that repentance is starting anew. That's it. It's a chance that God gives you to just take all the yoke of the burden of your past and just cast it off and say, nah, nah, I don't want to do it. My mother said it beautiful. She said she used to smoke. So after 50 years, she wanted to smoke. So she said, you know, just like I pick up the cigarette and put it to my lips, I can also take the cigarette and take it from my lips and put it back in the ashtray and leave it. And that's what I did, and I never picked it up again. You understand? Leave, cast it off, bro. Let it just slide off, man. Don't get too sad about past sins. You know what I'm saying? Like, cry over it. Yes, I'm not saying no. Show regret, show contrite, but don't dwell on it. Look to a new horizon. Look to the beauty of Hashem. Look to God's mercy. Don't always think, even though I know, I read you in my lot of videos, how Hashem smashes this and you're going to eat the afterbirth that comes between your legs. and this. Uh, those are for people that go against Hashem on purpose in a vicious way, bro. You understand? Then Hashem will humble you. And then you're going to go through things like that. But you don't have to go through any of that. No, man. Hashem is a merciful God, bro. Even when He humbles you with some punishments like starvation, God forbid, that's still... To clean you for your sins To get you next to him in heaven I mean he's an amazing God bro But he doesn't have to be With vengeance and wrath And death and all that Nah He's also the most loving God With tremendous loving kindness With mercy and abundance Always looking to help his child Always looking with a hand stretched out That's what he told I think it was the prophet Amos Maybe Zechariah I forgot Just tell the people Stretch out their hand to me And I'll stretch out my hand to them Nah, not even the reverse. My hand is stretched out. Tell them to grab it. Hashem's already there, yo. That's what he did with Moshe Rabbeinu, man. I got really <laughs> unbelievable, man, to learn the lessons of, of humbleness through God. Humility. It says that he came down to the tent of the meeting to meet Moses. What do you mean he came down to meet Moses? Moses should be running to go meet him. What, Hashem is waiting on Moses? Yes. Yes, Hashem said, come meet me, and he was there already waiting for him. The Torah says that to teach you that Hashem humbled himself and came down to Moshe Rabbeinu. Bro, that's, come on, man. Come on. It's craziness, man. Show me a king that's going to go and take his royal robe and put it on the floor so an old lady doesn't have to walk in a puddle. You show me a king that's going to do that. You know who's going to do that? Hashem is going to do that. Hashem will do that before even he thinks about it. It's already done. You know why? Because that's the mercy that Hashem has. Hashem is not afraid to humble himself and to let you know and to teach you a lesson. Yes, he lets you know a billion times. I'll destroy the world in a snap of a finger. No problem. But it never has to be like that, bro. It's always with love. Darke, darke, noam. You know why? Because that's who Hashem really is. When you're asking Hashem to get mad and get out of pocket and start punishing, he doesn't want to do it. He has to do it. 
You force his hand. It's the way, it's a protocol of life. It's the law of life. It's the law of the land. It's the law that God made it in the Torah that when you sin against him and you don't fix it over and over and over and over again, you don't feel any regret or any pain or shame, you're going to have to pay through suffering. And sometimes you might even be forgiven and still have to get a little smack because Hashem wants to wake you up to remind you, stay away from the sin, yo. And it's Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah coming up, man. Listen, I'll tell you like this, sin causes death, sin causes stress, sin causes everything, causes you to be anxious, to be frustrated, to have doubt, to not know what to do, to be confused, to be angst, to have anxiety, to be nervous, to be unsure of what you want to do. Why you want to be attached to sin? Don't be attached to sin, man. What kind of sins are there? Talking gossip? No need to talk gossip. Hashem is the king of the world. Somebody hurt you, he'll punish them. We all know it. So why do you need to talk gossip? Show God that you're willing to hold your tongue to show trust in him. Just like you would do to your father. Right? If you could have said something that could embarrass your father and you held your tongue, God forbid. I shouldn't make a comparison like that to Hashem to embarrass. But you understand what I'm saying. The bottom line is, bro, if you have a chance to hold your tongue and not say something and you do, you'll be blessed for that. And it's the same thing here. Hold your tongue. Hold your tongue. You don't need to tell the whole world what this person did to you. Hashem saw it. Hashem knows what he did. And Hashem will deal with it the way he sees fit. And that should be enough for you to accept. Hashem took us out of Egypt to show us kindness. You understand? Unmitigated kindness to show us how much he loves us. And that's for that we should be grateful. For that you should keep Shabbat. For that you should fast on Yom Kippur. For that you should not eat bread on, on Pesach. For that you should eat kosher. For that you should follow the laws of Nida. For that you should pray. For that you should always look for Hashem and show Him that you care for Him and that you show Him appreciation. It's very simple. The Egyptians didn't show the Jews appreciation. They got smashed. What are you talking about? Ten plagues. They didn't show appreciation to the sons of Yosef. Yes, absolutely. That's a fact. And that was a problem. Big timing. Hashem punished them with 10 vicious plagues. And Hashem said to the Jews that if you're going to keep forsaking my name, no problem. I'm going to bring upon you the plagues that I brought upon Egypt and the plagues that I didn't bring upon Egypt. You understand? What do you want to play with a God that's going to let you know to your face that he's not playing games with you? That yes, I took you out of Egypt. I'm asking you for very little. You know what it's like? It's like your father asking you every Thursday to go buy him a cup of coffee and bring it to him at 7 o'clock in the morning that's it and you live 20 minutes away 10 minutes away I don't know whatever okay another 10 minutes you gotta look for parking okay fine whatever but you would do it no that's all he's asking that's it that's it that's it that's all he wants he doesn't want you to send him a birthday gift he doesn't want you to call him nothing he just says to you my son every Thursday 7am make sure I have my coffee ready when I get up that's it I think every kid would do that for his father. Every kid would do Even if his father wasn't nice to him, I think a kid would understand to appreciate. He gave him money. He supported him. He fed him. I think everybody would do that. So what's Hashem asking? Hashem's asking more than that? He's not. It's exactly what he's asking for. Like a cup of coffee, 7 a.m. once. Because what Hashem does is tremendous. He gives you breath. He gives you life. He gives you the ability to walk, to talk, to see, to jump, to run. <laughs> Do you use those things to get closer to him or do you use those things to perform sins? Don't use your limbs to perform sins. I'm telling you right now, I like the way that came out. Don't use your limbs to perform sins because if you do, it's not going to end up good for you, bro. I promise you. Thank God for Chuba. Thank God. Thank God, Akadish Baruch Hu, that you made Chuba. Thank God because if not, we would be done. And I'm going to read you now some deep stuff. Listen, I like this. Check it. Immediately after being reproved for his deed, David turned to God in sincere repentance. Many psalms, particularly Psalm 51, expressed his regret for his deeds and his desire to reestablish his bond with God. And this is what he said, Cleanse me thoroughly of my wrongdoing and purify me of my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be pure. Cleanse me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear only joy and gladness and create in me a pure heart. O oh God, renew within me an upright spirit. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. I like that. The split into the kingdoms of Israel and Judah plunged the people into a process of spiritual decline. At times, the kings and the priests departed from the path of the Torah and led the nation to sin. At this juncture, the prophets were asked to exhort the nation to Chuvah. The prophet Hosea, Hosea 14.2 explained... 
Israel, return to God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Similarly, although Jeremiah warned the people that their sins would cause Jerusalem's imminent destruction, he promised them in 25.5, Please return from your evil ways and your wicked deeds, then you will dwell in the land forever. 2 Chronicles 33.6 describes how King Manasseh did much evil in the sight of God and introduced all forms of paganism to Israel. However, ultimately, he repented and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Using figurative terms, our sages relate that Manasseh had to carve a tunnel below the throne of glory for God to accept his tshuva. Nevertheless, he was willing to make great effort to return to God. The Book of Kings 2, 21, 24 through 9 relates that there were none like Ahav who dedicated himself to performing wickedness in the sight of God. However, when Ahav heard the severe words of admonition from Elijah the prophet, he rent his clothes, put sackcloth on his flesh, and fasted. God accepted his tshuva and told Elijah, See how Ahav humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. Yo, Hashem, Hashem is the most beautiful, bro. Tshuva is the legacy of the Jewish people, but not their sole, pro- sole property. Jonah relates to Tshuva of the people of Nineveh. I love it to show you. It's not just for the Jews. Ma. Jonah 3.10, God saw their deeds and that they repented of their evil ways. And he changed his mind about the punishment which he said he would inflict upon them. Every Yom Kippur, this narrative is recited as the Torah of the Mincha service to encourage us to follow their example. I like that. In the post-biblical period, our sages related a number of instances which individuals turned to God in complete tshuva. Natan Bar Ugva was strongly attracted to a married woman. His desire for her was so powerful that he became sick and was confined to his bed. Once this woman suffered a series of financial losses and was in dire need of the money, she sent word to Natan, Yes, I'm willing to be with you. I consent to your wishes. So he was like excited. He said, okay. But when she came to him, he was suddenly overcome by the fear of God and sent her home untouched. Afterward, his face shone with a godly light with which the sages compared to the rays of Moses' countenance. Sanhedrin 31, 31b, Rashi's commentary. I like that. And then I wanted to say this and apologize to Eliezer. It's Elazar. I used to say Elazar ben Dordea. It's Eliezer ben Dordea. And I'm going to tell you this beautiful story about him. There was a guy, he was with every prostitute in the world, but there was one, like, famous prostitute that he wasn't with, and he, like, did so much to finally go travel and see her. And he finally was with her, and he had relations with her. And right after they finished having relations, she burped. And you know what she said? She looked at him dead in the eye, and she said, just like this burp will never return to my mouth, so too Eliezer ben Dordea will never Return to the kingdom of God. Yo, when he heard this, he was in shock, bro. The fear of God took over him and he ran outside in a panic. And he looked up and he saw these two huge mountains and he said, Oh, mountains, oh, mountains, please pray for me and tell God that I'm sorry that I want to do tshuva. So the mountains looked at him and said, Pray for you. We're too busy praying for ourselves. So then he looked up at the moon, oh, moon, oh, moon, oh, humble moon. That Hashem humbled you and we should be blessed to be humble like you. Please tell Hashem I'm sorry. So the moon looked at him and said, pray for you. I'm too busy praying for myself. You don't remember when I came to Hashem and I wanted to be just as bright and take over the moon and take over the sun. So Hashem punished you. I'm still praying for that sin. I don't have time to pray for you. And then he looked at the stars, all stars that light up the night like beautiful candles. Please, please, can you pray for me? They looked at him, they said, pray for you. We're too busy praying for ourselves. Pray for yourself. So he sat back. He looked up to Shamayim. And he said, Hashem, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I sinned against you. And he started to cry and cry and cry. And so the Gemara says that he cried till he died. Yo, can you imagine with such a broken heart? That he left Hashem and he abandoned Hashem. You know what kind of shame you feel when you abandon God, bro? You do a sin that goes against God and you know it's bad. That's probably the most bitter, disgusting, emotional feeling you can have if you love God. That feeling would make you, would deter you from doing the sin. Like you would look at the sin and say, "Ah, I should do like a married man's going to cheat on his wife and say, you know what? Wow, I really want to do it. My passions and my desires are taking over me. 
show him a picture of the shame that's going to come upon him after the act how he's going to regret it how he's going to want to commit suicide how he's going to be on his balcony he's going to want to jump because he cheated on his wife and his three beautiful daughters you understand what's going on bro the pain of the shame should deter you from doing that sin i'm telling you or any sin amen and i'm going to give you some deep secrets on repentance first with king david you know what King David said in Psalms 116, verses 2 and 3. I found sorrow and trouble, but I will call in the name of the Lord. Then in Psalms 116, verse 13. And I will raise the cup of salvation, and I will call in the name of the Lord. From far away, beeswax and gold look similar. But when heated, the beeswax melts, and when gold is heated, it glows. So a beautiful analogy would be like pressure, right? When someone's under the heat, you know, they say, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Someone's under a lot of pressure, a lot of heat. If he's great, he'll shine. If not, he'll crumble. You understand? That's what it is. He'll melt. Rambam, Shmone Perakim, chapter 3. A person may seek drunkenness and material gratification in order to fill his natural desires. However, in time, his behavior will become habitual and it will lead to thirst and further physical desire. He finds himself on a never-ending treadmill, constantly chasing pleasure and never finding lasting satisfaction. Why did God pour out his wrath on the nation of Israel? For two reasons. One, because they broke the covenant. And two, because they served alien gods. Gratitude is a big thing with God, bro. You better get it through your head. He took us out of Egypt, made us his nation, and this is how we repay him? Deuteronomy 29, 27. God drove them from their land in rage, anger, and great fury and exiled them to another land as you are here today. The Jewish people were granted Eretz Israel on the condition that they observed the Torah and the mitzvot. If they violate that covenant, the land, because of its holiness, will not be able to tolerate their presence and they will be driven into exile. The word used is ve'yashlichem, ve'yashlichem. And when you look at the word, it means he exiled them. You take the lamed in that word, and it's extra big. You know why? To signify that the exile will be long and in distant countries. The prophet Stephania proclaims, At that time I will bring you back, and at that time I will gather you in, for I will make you renowned and glorified amongst all the people of the earth when I bring back your captivity before your eyes. Jeremiah 31, 31, 32. Behold, days are coming, says God, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my Torah in their inner parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. I like that. Deuteronomy 30, 17 and 18. But if your heart turns aside and you do not listen, you will be led astray and you will bow down and worship foreign gods. I hereby warn you today that if you do that, you will be utterly exterminated. You will not endure long in the land which you are coming to inherit after crossing the Jordan. Now we're going to get deep into tshuva, into repentance. First, you should know right off the bat, staka, tshuva, and tefillah, tatsil memavet. Those things will save you from death. There's a story about a guy who went to work. He shared his lunch and when he went to go in the bag to get the sandwich to share it, he saw a snake and he killed it. If not, he would have got bit by that snake and died. So going to share the meal, that's what made him go look in the bag. Hashem put it in his head to go look in the bag. Why? Because he did tshuva. He was, I mean, he did staka. He was looking to share his meal. I'm telling you, this is crazy how it works. These things are powerful. Tefillah, you can pray to God, he'll change it. He'll have a decree and he'll change the decree. So that's another one. And then you have tefillah, tzaka, and tshuva. Perfect. We get, listen. Repentance implies a reversal of previous behavior. A person becomes conscious of the shortcomings of his previous deeds and firmly resolves to change his behavior in the future. Repentance stresses an awareness of our faults and weaknesses and failures. These realizations serve as a powerful motivating force to prompt us to improve our behavior. 
From man's very first moments, repentance was necessary. After the sin of the tree of the knowledge, after the sin of the tree of knowledge, Adam returned to God and was thus saved from immediate death. His son Cain also repented after the murder of Abel. When did you send with the golden? Ah, sorry. When you sinned with the golden calf, the whole nation was supposed to be destroyed, but repentance saved us. That's what it is. Sorry. When we sinned with the golden calf, the whole nation was supposed to be destroyed, but repentance saved us. Cleanse me through my. I like this. This is what King David said. Cleanse me thoroughly of my wrongdoing, and purify me of my sins. Purge me with hyssop, and I should be pure. Cleanse me, and I should be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew within me an upright spirit, and I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Jeremiah 25:5. Please return from your evil ways and your wicked deeds. So you may dwell in the land forever. King Ahab did shuba. You know when? When the prophet Elijah came and gave him harsh words, he got nervous and got scared. And God told the prophet Elijah, "See how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days." We learn a lot about repentance from the story of Jonah and the whale. Right? What happened when he went to Nineveh? He told the goyim, "Repent," and they did, and they got saved. That's a lesson to the Jews. Wake up! The goyim repented for sure. He forgives them, and for sure, double he'll forgive you. The suffering of Job for seventy years does not even correspond to a brief period of the suffering in hell. Wow, wow, wow! That's really why you should repent. Plus, for the love of Hashem, only the ignorant ignores repentance. A wise man. Right away, jumps on the opportunity to save his soul. Now I'm going to give you 20 qualities that are fundamental to tshuva. Number one, regret, abandoning the sin, contemplating the seriousness of the sin, experience of the pain, worry, shame, humility, humbled actions, conquering physical desire, correcting one's behavior, introspection, and examination of one's deeds, the realization of the seriousness of each sin. Considering all the sins equally important, every act of a sin is a rebellion against God, no matter how big or how small. Remember that: confession, prayer, correcting one's sins, to constantly see good deeds, to recall one's sins constantly, but only briefly, to avoid depression, to forsake one's sins when the desire is strong, and to motivate others to repent. Six things that generally force a person. To do tshuva, they are trouble, advancing age, listening to the words of the musar from the wise, studying Torah and the ten days of repentance, and the knowledge that the fate is not in your hands; it's in God's. We must learn to control our desires and not be controlled by them. I like that. Deuteronomy 31:16. God said to Moses, "When you lie with your ancestors, this nation shall rise up and stray after alien gods of the land into which they are coming. They will abandon me and violate the covenant which I made with them." Deuteronomy 31:17 and 18. My anger will rage against them on that day, and I will abandon them, and I will hide my face from them, and they will flee from their enemies. And many evils and troubles will befall them on that day, and they will say, "It's because my God is no longer with me that these evils have come upon us." On that day, I will utterly hide my face because of all the evil that they have done in turning to alien gods. You know what a disrespect it is, bro, to have God ready to serve you and you go run to a fake, false god. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Let's not be nuts, bro. Let's not act crazy. You understand? Be respectful, man. Seriously, I think that's what the world is really lacking right now. It's just basic common decency, civility, and respect. Hashem gave you seven days of the week. He asked for one day back. Give it to him, bro. Don't make me tell the Shabbat Shalom Dave story, yo. Then you're really gonna know, man. And I'm gonna tell this one perfect Hashem. I'm gonna flip it with a little pizzazz. So there was this guy. His name was Dave. And he was, you know, a secular guy in Philadelphia. Whatever, the lecture, rabbi, YouTube, 
finds himself in Munsi in Yeshiva. He's there for a couple of years, whatever, a year and a half. And he says to the rabbi, Rabbi, I want to go back to Philadelphia to spend time with my family. So Rosh Hashanah coming up. The rabbi said to him, listen, I'm afraid that you're going to go back to your old neighborhood. Your girlfriend lives across the street. Your ex-girlfriend, Goya. All your friends do drugs. You used to smoke weed every day. I don't feel comfortable that your parents don't keep Shabbat. It's the environment. It's not good for you, bro. I know you, bro. You're very tempted by sin. You're going to break easy, and I'm going to lose you. Do not go home. Trust me. Wait another six months. So David looked at him and said, You know what, Rabbi? You're right. He went to sleep that night, and in the middle of the night, escaped. I say escaped, but you know what I'm saying. He left. Got his car, drove to Philadelphia. Long story short, after about three weeks, that's it. He was already with his ex-girl. Started smoking weed again. Sees his parents breaking Shabbat. All they do is make more and more money. He's like so confused. He starts to have a lot of doubts in Hashem. So he finds himself Friday night, sitting in front of the TV. It's about 7 o'clock. Shabbat starts 7.30. He says to Hashem, I don't know what's going on, man. I'm losing faith in you, Hashem. So I'm asking you to give me a sign if you're real. If by 7.30 you give me a sign that you're real, I will not put on the TV and chill. I will right away go Daven Arvit, do Kiddush, and keep Shabbat. You have my word, but you have to give me a sign because I don't know if you're real. So he waits till 7.30, no sign. He says, Hashem, please, please, I know you're real, but I need proof. I'll give you to 10.30. If by 10.30 you do not give me a sign, I put the TV on and I apologize, Achi. I don't even know if you're real. 10.30 comes, no sign. So exactly what he says. He goes, you know what? I like baseball. And in baseball, it's three strikes, you're out. So to say 100% I gave you a chance to perform the sign, I never want you to claim that I didn't give you a chance to perform the sign. If you're real, perform the sign by 12.15. Yalla, I give you another two hours. You are the Almighty, the God, the Lord of hosts. You control everything. Give me a sign. If by 12.15 you don't give me a sign, I put the TV and balash. That's it. I'm not worried about it. 12.15 comes, no sign. He takes the remote and he goes to put on the TV. Now remember, it's Friday night and his name is Dave. And the David Letterman show happens to be on. So when he puts on the TV, it's going to come on to the David Letterman show. It's 12.15 and David Letterman is interviewing Tom Hanks. And he just happened to get back from Israel. So David Letterman looks at Tom Hanks and says, you know what? Didn't you just get back from Israel? He goes, yeah. He goes, look into that camera right there and say something in Hebrew. So he's looking right into the camera and as he goes to speak... This kid, Dave, takes the remote and turns on the TV. When he turns on the TV, he's looking dead at Tom Hanks. And you know what Tom Hanks says to him? Looks him right in his eye. And he goes, Shabbat Shalom, Dave. Yo, this kid got so nervous. He threw the remote up in the air. It was like shaking. He couldn't believe he got his sign. How Hashem does things, bro. Hashem, you know they say he works in mysterious ways because everything is too deep. For you to calculate, man, when you just lay back, fall back, watch my movie coming out, bro. I was about to say a book, but Hashem made me say movie. Maybe that's going to be fall back. Ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. Only with the power and the strength of Hashem can I write something like that. (laughs) I don't want to give it away. I gave it away on some of my old lectures, but now I want to kind of hold it in. Just know it's about a guy. (laughs) <laughs> that he becomes famous on social media and he's always like talking about God oh I trust God and all this and God and God and I, people start getting nauseous of him he has 75 million followers but there's all these atheists on social media that like can't stand him so he's talking about God this that so one atheist billionaire said you really trust God huh he said yeah ooh, ooh. he said you can even test me how much I trust God he goes oh yeah I'll give you $15 million. Go to the top of this 20-story building. Go to the edge with your back. To the edge and fall back. And if God really loves you, he'll save you. If you really trust God, you'll fall back, bro. If you're really real, like you say, you're on your Instagram page all day talking about how much you trust God. See if you're real. Put your life where your mouth is. That's what he told him. Not your money, because he's not putting up money. He's putting his life. 
But for the 15 mil, you know what he said? Absolutely, I'll do it. He said, you're going to go to the top of the 20-story building that I'm going to pick out, and you're just going to fall back? He goes, absolutely, I trust God. And if I show God that I really trust him, I'm willing to give up my life, he'll make a miracle for me. This guy starts laughing at him on social media. So it becomes like a big deal on social media. Everyone starts hearing about the story, how it challenged him. All the people that believe in God are like encouraging, you know, do it, do it. God will perform the miracle. All the people that don't believe in God are like, do it, do it. Because they want him to die to show that God is not real. So finally the day comes and then I can't tell you what happens. Maybe on another talk, I'll break it down to you. Now, I said I wanted to do three lectures in 24 hours. This is the second one, and I'm almost done. And then I got one more to do tomorrow by like 3 o'clock. I said I'll get it done. Thank God, Hashem, I appreciate all the wisdom you allow me to retain in my brain, to train my brain, to always know to respect your holy name. And to know that when I don't sin, I will never feel shame or never feel pain. And I will only gain. Even if I head through tough terrain, you're always going to be with me the same. Everything is going to be perfect when you let Hashem reign. You understand? Let God do what He needs to do. Fall back. Fall back and let God do what He needs to do, man. Trust me when I tell you. And I love you. Show gratitude. Do tshuva. Do tshuva like Ninveh. Do tshuva like Achav. Do tshuva like Menashe. Do tshuva like Eliezer ben Dordea. Do tshuva like King David. Do tshuva. Give me somebody else, a Kaddish Baruch, who did tshuva, but somebody nice. Then I'll have like a good proof. Somebody who did strong tshuva. I did Menashe. I did Achav. Come on, Akadish Baruch Hu, somebody new, come on. Ooh, Nebuzardan. Wow, that's, we're going to go extra deep. Not even a Jew, a non-Jew. The chief executioner of Nebuchadnezzar killed thousands of Jews to avenge the blood of Zechariah Then felt guilty from the murdering of all these innocent people. Not innocent, but the people that he slaughtered in the name of Zechariah. I'm sure there was justice. Maybe it was the children of the people that killed Zechariah. But... Very deep stuff, yo. But Nebuzardan, after he killed all those people and the blood of Zechariah stopped boiling on the temple floor, he went home, he divorced his wife, the Chuba, and converted to Judaism. How beautiful is that? Ooh, and Hashem is telling me to tell you about Eved Melech. They threw Jeremiah in a pit, in a mud pit. And this black slave felt bad for Jeremiah because he knew he was very holy and he had trusted in God a lot, this black slave. And he came to the king Sidkiah when he begged him. He said, listen, take him out of the pit. I'm telling you, this guy is not a bad guy. Like, plea. And he t- took a chance with his life because the king could execute him. He just walk up to the king and start talking to him like he's his friend. But he like really, I don't know, maybe he hugged his leg, begged him, please, please. He was pleading for the life of Jeremiah. And you know what? It touched the heart of King Tzedkiah. And he allowed him to go. And he, I'll never forget, he said, take 30 men with you. You know why 30? Why would he need 30 men to take Jeremiah out of the pit? The answer is because there was in the middle of a famine. The people were starving and weak. So it took 30 men to pull him up. And I remember it said he brought rags to put it under his armpit. So that when they brought him up in the harness, it didn't hurt him. This Evid Melech, ah, then the next verse it says, And Hashem blessed Evid Melech. He told the prophet Jeremiah, Go tell him that I will be with him wherever he goes and he'll have nothing to fear. Ah, imagine getting that stamp from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You actually could get that stamp from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you just do all the mitzvot, stay away from sin. Praise his name every second you get. You'll get not only heaven, you'll get double heaven. Hashem is looking to reward. You guys don't get it. They always talk about, you know, and sometimes me also, you know, about the wrath of God. And it must be spoken about because, like I said, bro, fear. (laughs) I tell you a bunch of things. You know how many times in the Torah it says to fear me is good for you. Uh, The foundation of wisdom is fear. Uh, 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 
let me fear you so I don't sin. Uh, a person who fears God is wise. Uh, fear, I will unfold the secrets of my Torah to all those who fear me. You know how many proofs I can give you with fear? Fearing Hashem is beautiful. And there's two types of fear. Fear of the punishment, which is a lower level. And then fear of the greatness of letting down the Father in heaven. In other words, you're like in fear of letting Him down. You're in awe of His greatness and you're in fear that you're going to let Him down. That's a very high level to get to. But I promise you, if you just fear God and fear the punishment and you don't sin, that's very noble. Don't ever let anybody tell you that's not because if they do, they're the Satan or the soldier of the Satan. Excuse me. Guaranteed. I 100% bro. It's just like if somebody told you, oh, you can never do chuba for that. Oh, well. Oh. Here, I'll show you something beautiful about chuba. How do you do chuba for an abortion? You're a woman, you had an abortion. You know how you do chuba? There's only one way. Either become an anti abortion activist and prevent women from getting abortions. All you would have to do is save one woman who was going to have an abortion from not having one, and you just did chuba. Took a life, gave a life. Beautiful. That's the power of Chuba. There was a guy. Hi, a bus driver, secular bus driver, and a girl jumped up in front of his bus. He hit her and she died. And the mother was sitting in the front seat. And he got up. And when he realized that was the mother, because people were coming up to her and she was like so heartbroken, he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't see her. It wasn't my fault. This, that. So, you know what she said to him? She said, Listen, I see you feel bad. But I just want you to know You took a soul Now it's time to return a soul Your soul Start keeping the mitzvot Start keeping Shabbat Start eating kosher If you're married Keep the arata mishpacha Do it for the soul of my daughter So that she didn't die in vain And he did Beautiful Chubach you look at immodest pictures of women on the internet or you look at immodest women even at the beach you're married cry cry why because that sin is right in your brain so you know how you fix it with your brain right you purify it by crying Hashem I just want you to know that I mega appreciate you keeping me alive yo after all the sins I did as a kid and how rude I was and how I just was just very Disrespectful sometimes when I didn't get my way, spoiled, ego, selfish, a lot of that when I was young. And I worked on myself hard at Kaddish Baruch Hu. And it's one of the most beautiful feelings in the world. I promise you, you could bench press a thousand five hundred pounds right now, and you will not feel the joy in your heart that I feel knowing that I used to be angry, upset, and frustrated. And now I trust God and I'm chill and relaxed. It's one of the most beautiful feelings you'll ever experience in your life. Remember that always. And I could keep growing. And if I don't take it serious, I could fall back, God forbid. Even though I know that will never happen. You know why? Because I already secured the bag. I already understand that it's not worth it to get upset. That hating destroys the hater. That when I get upset, God doesn't come to me. Just like with the prophet, when they're mad and sad, it shows to Hashem that they don't trust Him. So when I get upset, it shows Hashem I don't trust Him. What's the difference? Even though they're on a, such a higher level than me, they're prophets. But the lesson is the same. It's very simple. Very simple. Trust God. That's what the whole Torah is about. That's what the book or the movie I'm going to do fall back it's all about trusting God will he make the miracle and save this guy or not <laughs> fall back I like that man everybody I tell that story to they get one guy told me that's amazing another guy told me uh, I got chills <laughs> yo it gets dope feedback bro because it's a deep story yo and I love that Hashem gave me the merit to think about it in my brain for that Hashem, for that alone I love you. But for all the other five quadrillion things you do for me. Every blood vessel in my body working right now. My heart pumping, I don't even feel it. Don't even feel it. all the blood in my brain. Going through all the little pathways. Feeding every ounce of my body with blood to heal me. 
to always make sure I'm okay. Hashem, I really love you a lot, yo. I love you a lot, Akadosh Baruch Hu, because I know you're realer than real. You know how I know you're real? Because we're in a ball rotating around the sun in the middle of space. And the only place where you can have a face, facts. That's how I know you're real. It would be impossible for that scenario to take place without a supernal being and a power that runs the world. And on that note, I just want to say I love you, Hashem, always and forever. Amen.